we in? We're in. Welcome to week three. I trust you rose above the technical difficulties where it was playing behind you, but no audio. Correct? Well, anyway. <clears throat> Life in the 21st century. Uh, a note on social recons. Get rid of stuff. Um, remember the syllabus says, the syllabus is whatever your particular religious holy book, if you have one or not, the syllabus is the Bible, right? So it specifies Microsoft Word, that's the college standard, the Microsoft Office Suite. If you don't use that and you're sending by email, make sure your paper is in the body text of the email. Because, for example, if you send me an attachment in pages, and the person who did that, like they did send it in the body text of the email so it worked out, pages can't be read by a PC, which is also the college standard, which I don't like. I don't compose on them, but whatever. Yeah, there, there we have it. So pages would have been unreadable by the college PC, but you put, posted it in the body text so it wound up working okay. But understand, if you're using email, uh, use the email as a backup if you're not going to use Microsoft Word as a standard, but the syllabus does specify Microsoft Word as the standard. Any questions from last week? It's okay. Be the first. Be daring. I just had a hard time finding your office. Oh, okay. Building one, room 226, around the corner from Trio. Or counseling. All right. Are you going to work? Yes. Okay. So, the idea of the class is to basically start with it, the original. Um, idea was substance abuse prevention, but addiction is more than just substance abuse. So addiction prevention technology to the general populace in a way that enables lay people to become proficient in some of the basics. Now some of those basics, so for example, uh, your dentist will tell you besides, you know, eating a healthy diet and all that, uh, brushing your teeth for two minutes followed by flossing, then mouthwash if you're going to be fanatical. And basic principles of self-care, which when practiced, avoid most substance use or addiction problems. Self-care is kind of culturally bound. And what I mean by culturally bound is that there is this invisible dimension that we uh, basically culture is kind of like an invisible dimension, like uh, water to a fish. And we're trying to make it visible. So providing a culturally competent and culturally proficient framework. So culturally competent means there's a skill that you can practice. By, and culturally proficient means that you can actually change the culture that you came out of, or change its effect on you, rather than just accept it. So for what constitutes healthy behavior, counters the generic mainstream approach which actually promotes substance abuse by ignoring certain cultural protective factors. Now, um, as I've said, not that I want to go on this whole, because uh, sometimes I get the criticism and you know I'll own only part of it. And the part that I'll own is cultural protective factors from a mainstream approach, usually refer to those practiced by ethnic minorities as if white people don't have a culture. That's the position of mainstream. Culture is everybody except white people. So look at when you see American history, like the way I was raised with American history. Like there was a piece, of, you know, as I was driving back from LA yesterday, you know, there's a piece on Columbus Day. Well, right? So. Bob Mondello is talking about his Columbus Day with President Kennedy at the White House, right? Because they didn't talk about like the other side of the equation, Columbus and Native Americans. 
So this week, you know, Native Americans are celebrating indigenous solidarity. Week, not Columbus Day, indigenous solidarity week. So the fact that that isn't necessarily included as part of your American history course, or I grew up with cowboys and Indians, where in those era of Hollywood, Indians were played by white people in makeup. So whose idea of normal is that? You know, Tonto, Lone Ranger and Tonto. Tonto is supposed to be Apache, and Tonto in Spanish means dumb only in Hollywood, when an Apache called himself stupid in the language of the enemy. <laughs> but, you know, all that kind of stuff was normal and unquestioned, right? So the American drug cycle of the 50s, which was cigarettes in the workplace, booze in the workplace, downers, and then uppers to take you up, amphetamines, right? That whole American drug cycle. That was normal and unquestioned. In the 1600s, Puritans giving rum to four-year-olds. That was normal, right? So nobody questioned that until we in the 20th and 21st century start saying, uh, got to check that out. Maybe there's something different. Maybe you weren't always like that. Maybe the Irish and the Germans and the Russians weren't always drunks. What happened to them? And then, you know, other folks, right? So cultural protective factors are things that were in the culture that kept you from becoming addicted that you lost by becoming American. And that's part of the whole in terms of looking at the research in terms of prevention. Where did that come from? So this is from the original class proposal. So you cannot do prevention unless you can talk about the subject. So one of the nice things about living in an American context and living in a context of academic freedom is that you can talk about this stuff, right? All right. So you need to be able to talk about the subject so people can make informed decisions. So for example, HIV is a sexually transmitted disease or STI, sexually transmitted infection. Worldwide, the spread of AIDS is linked to the ability of women to request and utilize barrier methods. Globally, HIV is a heterosexual transmitted disease. That's the majority of the infections. We only trip about gay people because that's only where the infection first got known here. Globally, it's like heterosexual transmission. And there are places globally, particularly like Africa, certain countries in the Middle East, Asia, where HIV was actually spread by sexual tourism by the US military. Not intentionally, but soldiers basically participating in the sex industry in Asia. UN fact. In my opinion. Right? So, heterosexual disease. So, in Africa, unless a woman can first, A, refuse sex, like no glove, no love, if she can't do that in her culture, she's going to be subject to HIV transmission if her husband strays. If she's not in a culture that where women can, one, talk about sex, two, get access to barrier methods, right? In order to have to talk about barrier methods, you have to talk about sex. Your culture doesn't allow you to talk about sex, boom. There it is, right? So here, I mean, this may be uncomfortable, but since the mid-80s, drug counselors, addiction counselors, have had to talk about sex lives of our clients because 90% of the people who became HIV positive in the United States did so under the influence of alcohol or some drug, right? Because do you see portrayals of people knocking boots or having sex sober? No, right? Bars, etc. 
have a drink, have a joint, whatever, get you in the mood. So are you going to be talking about your partner's history? Are you going to you know, get the, use the home HIV test on the first date? So in order to be able to use that skill, you have to be comfortable talking about uncomfortable stuff until it becomes comfortable. So you can't do prevention without being able to have the conversation and feeling comfortable with it. Sorry to go there, but that is just real. I'm talking about saving lives here. That, you know I'm kind of fanatical about that. So, if your culture doesn't allow you to talk about sex, you can't do HIV prevention. And if your culture doesn't talk about addiction, then you can easily be addicted. Real easy. So when we talk about uh, a cultural po offensive, so this is not a war per se, but the adversary wins by having you be strung out on the things that make you weaker and them more profitable. So it's not simply just about them making money, necessarily. But that's an easy one to look for, follow the money. You can see, oh, this is why this is going that way. This is why there aren't warning labels giving you dose-to-weight relationships on alcohol. This is why I will, actually in the pro class I talk about this, but this is a real person, I'll just show you how this works, okay? Guy I will call Tony Soprano, real student, really Italian. And, of course, part of his cultural identity, in addition to the pasta and meatballs and paella and all that other kind of stuff, is a glass of wine with dinner. Which, in a European context, works okay, because you're not drinking to get drunk. Okay? But he, is, he and his family you know, drink a lot of wine. He knows not to come drunk to school. That is his work, right? But he didn't necessarily know that a daily dose of wine would trigger the shakes and initiate feelings of anxiety. Okay, So he goes to a doc, hey, I feel nervous, I feel socially anxious. Oh, okay, well, let's give you a pill. Clearly the warning label on the pill says, do not drink it with alcohol. Right? But, or, or don't drink in excess. But it also says, do not drink with alcohol, which clients or patients do not drink to excess. Well, I'm just having a glass of wine with my Valium and my Cymbalta and Valium and Cymbalta. Okay, so drinks his usual glass of wine, driving home from wherever, gets a Dewey, boom. Right? Comes to see me. Uh, oh, did you see the warning labels? How much did you drink on top of that? Oh, my usual half a bottle to a bottle of wine. Okay, that's where your problem would come in. How long have you been doing that? Years. Okay, so if you hadn't gotten a Dewey, we wouldn't have detected there's a problem, and you wouldn't have thought that there's a problem, and you didn't think that your use was problematic but you were technically addicted. Now, I'm not going to say, since you're under a doctor's care, I'm not going to say go cold turkey off the of Cymbalta and the Valium, right? But you cannot drink on top of those, right? That's what's producing part of your symptom, right? So the fact that he didn't get that information and that whole dimension of what is considered normal culture and I'm not putting down the Italians from their love of food and wine. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, okay, you need to be pharmacologically competent as a layperson. All right, so less about a war and less to make him more about making you more human than your adversary. So some of us were more human before we became Americans, and some of us are considered less than human after we came to America even though we have the values that Americans, like low drug using culture, respect for elders, children, family values, etc. So culture affects everything we do.
culture shapes individuals, and individuals can shape culture. So assume your full humanity, live free. Going poetic, I do have a poetic license. So if you think about who you are as kind of like a garden, you till that garden, you leave out the weeds, pun intended, <laughs> cultivate that which makes you strong, and kind of resist the larger culture's messages about uh, what you should or should not do uh, that is not optimal for your health. <laughs> and uh, try and adopt a humorous attitude because them that lasts, laughs, lasts. So, those of us who are born Americans, like me, our health demands that we become more than consumers, but also self-healers. And that's what Angie Arian's book uh, begins to suggest in a fourfold way. It's about warrior, taking that defensive stance, healer, teacher, and visionary. So, we move from being addicts through recovery towards fully human. Which is not to suggest that addicts are less than humans, just that you could be more fully human. So, in a sense, we're a guerrilla movement because we're outgunned. We're outspent. We basically have to depend on changing the hearts and minds of people with no budget. So, it's not so much watch your back, but watch your breath. So, what I didn't necessarily get into with all the breath work examples I gave you was actually showing you one that's an easy one. So, sit up straight. This is a four-corner breath. So, one of the things we notice, so if you inhale to a... So, there's four sections to the breath. There's an inhale. There's a suspend, where you're not holding, you're not closing off your windpipe, you're just suspending the breath in, holding it at the top, without closing off the windpipe. That's the suspend. Exhale out and hold the suspend out. Inhale to a five count. Suspend. Exhale to a five count. Suspend out. And then repeat that a minimum of four times. We call this the four corner breath. Basically, slowing your breath down to three breaths a minute. When you do that, for a minimum of two and a half minutes, you produce an endorphin reaction in your brain, which begins to calm you and slow, lower your blood pressure, among other things. Okay, you produce a chemical change. Minimum of two and a half, say three minutes. There's others, but that's a basic one. So basically, slowing down your breath. So breath work is often the first way. So we talked about breath work uh, last week as a way of aligning and balancing the mind and the spirit, and defining spirit without necessarily going into a religious context as that which gives or brings life. So your mind is partly how you begin to understand how things work. And your feelings and emotions are also an indicator. So, for example, Einstein's famous equation equals mc squared. Basically, energy and matter are the same thing moving at different speeds. Energy, in fact, is matter moving faster. It's one of the basic equations within quantum physics, which basically says, okay, this stuff isn't actually physical, it's energy relationships. It's not solid. It just appears to be solid. Probability patterns are hard to compress. 
because the actual molecules are actually there's more space in the molecule than in the molecules. So, yeah. Anyway, reason I was going off into that. All right, your spirit is ener energy animating matter. So the analogy that I like to utilize is just like electricity runs your computer, you unplug it, you need battery power, basically spirit is animating your body. And certainly within um, certain traditions, uh, literally breath is part of what's animating you, though certainly you know, life begins with an inhale and it ends with an exhale. So certainly in between your first inhale and your last exhale, control of the breath has lots of side effects in terms of skill development. So your spirit is energy ma animating matter. Where your spirit is gone, your body dies. When your spirit, where your spirit goes is not the subject of this class. Uh, but there are some interesting references in popular culture about, uh, let's see, that movie 21 Grams where um, basically I think uh, they executed somebody and they weighed his body and there was a 21 gram weight loss uh, when he was alive, between when he was alive and when he was dead. Like, okay, so what is that 21 grams? Because it ain't the air, it ain't the liquid. You're alive, but what, and when you're alive you got 21 grams more than when you did? Like, so what is the energy, wait, energy doesn't have mass, so what is the energy that weighs 21 grams that's present in the body that when, it, when the body is dead, you weigh 21 grams less? Anyway, whatever that is, because technologically, we have not discovered what that energy is. We haven't. Just that it's there. Just that it's there. Now... Other older systems like the Chinese, you know, with the Qi system or the Qi system claim to, you know, math meridians. And certainly you can teach a 10-year-old white kid to break bricks using karate. That isn't strength training. So certainly you can, there's skill development with, you know, using energies that we can't detect with Western technology. All I'm saying is that you using that construct that we b I borrowed from uh, Native Americans about bo body, mind, s emotions, and spirit. Whatever the spirit is, you can gain access to it uh, to some degree using your breath. Thought I change this, but I'll go with this. Algebra means the mending. And uh, those of you who are taking math 1665, probably didn't talk about this, right? I'm using this philosophically. Algebra literally means in Arabic the mending. The image is of a broken stick. The equal sign unites two sides of the equation. What you do to this side, you got to do to that side. What you do above, you got to do below till you reach uh, final answer. So when we talk about emotional equations, so this is a suicide equation. And it basically reads like this. If you understand algebra, order of operations, PEMDAS, please excuse my flute, dear Aunt Sally, Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, <coughs> addition, subtraction. Work the equation in that order, you get the correct answer. In other words, if we're applying this to emotions and counseling, do the hardest thing first. Go to the center of the emotional pain first. Okay, so in addictions work, in terms of counseling. It isn't the drug-taking behavior that we look at. The drug-taking behavior is a symptom of something else. So we've got to get to that something else first. So I just wanted to keep, you, keep this in the back of your mind. This ain't a counseling session. I'm just saying, okay, what we do here is not just look at the addictive behavior, but the addictive behavior is a symptom of something else. Something's driving it. All right, so expanded anger denied expression, A minus E, 
multiplied becomes depression. So lots of people say they're depressed or have a, a um, diagnosis of depression, as did the person for whom I developed this equation, who was a um, 16-year-old female who'd been sexually abused by a religious parent and was a cutter as well as attempting suicide through various means. So, and couldn't talk about it and couldn't report, even to the mandatory reporter, it took about a year of cultivating her to say, okay, what's bugging you? Why are you taking this out on yourself? So, anger denied expression multiplied becomes depression. So, this per the multiplied was basically 50, and that's just the stuff that she could remember, separate incidents of abuse that she couldn't talk about and couldn't express and wouldn't be believed and et cetera, et cetera. So that multiplied, that anger, without going being expressed, became depression. But she had a clinical diagnosis of depression and nobody asked the question, are you being abused? Okay, so... Some forms of depression are anger that are not being expressed. So then to solve the equation, you basically express it and then not, you know, not just for each particular incident, but overall. Okay, so do the hardest thing first. Go to the center of the greatest pain and the greatest wound and heal it. So. I came up with an alternative order of operation. Pain, loss, and fear. Depression. Anger. Serenity. So, for example, a number of people can understand the equation about anger being actually a mask for pain. Well, if anger is a mask for pain, then you've got to get to the pain. Take the mask off. Pain, loss, fear. Then those things can either, if they've been sublimated or pushed down, they can become depression. Or when you realize that this has happened, you can also go through depression. Depression's a stage. So could you solve it with, like, depression plus expression multiplied equals serenity? Anger plus anger expressed okay. Okay. So. Uh, can come, become serenity after a while. Okay. But you have to heal the wound properly. So I mean, if we're using this analogy, this metaphor, right? Bruises heal different than cuts. Burns, which degree of burn is it? Sunburn, wind burn, First, second, third, fourth degree burn, those are nasty. Well, you have, the treatment protocol is different. You have to acknowledge the wound. Here's, for example, the, this is actually getting into kind of treatment stuff, but it's useful for lay people to understand. When we get into the pharmacology later in the broadcast, so for example, certain drugs like meth, Okay? Meth, its legal application is in war. That's what it was originally developed for, to develop a killing rage in soldiers, in combat, so that you could do pretty much horrific things, even if you were a moral person, and not feel anything about it and be paranoid. Listen, Whiteman Air Base, right? It's a B-2 wing during Kosovo. B-2 bomber ain't got no room in a cockpit for a coffee machine. It's a 16 hour round trip, okay? So you give them Adderall. You script pilots with Adderall, then they can make the trip 
to Kosovo and back just by taking pills. Don't have to pee. And if they're a little paranoid, well, maybe you want people paranoid driving a $500 billion aircraft. That's not a bad thing. You also don't want them flying missions every day because you don't want them strung out either. I ain't making this up. You know I don't have to make stuff up, right? <laughs> okay, so yes, yeah, soldiers and little kids is the legal prescriptive use for uh, and college students who fake ADHD and want to stay up and study because don't think we know, don't know about that. <clears throat> so part of the piece in terms of looking at that, the reason I went off on that whole thing with meth is when you come off of it, okay, you've essentially created a wound in your brain where, just like when you cut your finger, ow, it stings, you stop the blood, you, know, you put a little whatever on it, ow, it stings, and then you put the Band-Aid over it and it still stings when you move it. And then the most annoying part is the itching. The itching is healing. Drug recovery for the brain is boredom. That's what makes recovery so difficult. Okay? Because literally from the brain's point of view, using any drug because the natural chemicals that are in your brain that the drug is simulating are in such small amounts. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember these cartoons if they still have them. But like Wile E. Coyote when he gets the safe dropped on his head. Okay? That's what drugs are like to the brain. And then when you stop using them, the brain where I know there's a piano coming in somewhere. Right? Boredom is itching to the brain. It's healing. It's a necessary state. And, that, you, know, and you know how Americans love boredom. <laughs> so they resist it. They, you know, oh, I, okay, if I can't do uh, you know, alcohol or meth or cocaine, I'll dodge into gambling or I'll do video games or I'll do something else. Anything except slow down and pay attention to yourself. Oh, I'm boring. Hmm. Really? Okay. So, your mind is energy animating your physical brain. There we, in these days we like to use the computer analogy, if you want to think of it as software. Your emotions are partially energy and partially based on the physical chemicals produced in your body, um, known as neurotransmitters or neurohormones or basically collectively known as neurochemicals. The neuro meaning nerves. Hey, your physical body is both the hardware built by DNA and the software that goes along with DNA. So for example, spiders, you've seen spiders, yes? Spider never meets its parents. They're dead. Spider knows how to make a web. Why? How does it know how to make a web? What do we call that? Instinct. Okay? In that word instinct, you are acknowledging that if the spider never went to spider web school, never saw its parents, but it knows how to make a web, some kind of system memory is being transmitted along with DNA, not just the physical body. If that's true for spiders, why wouldn't it be true for you? If the only connection between those Scandinavian twins raised by alcoholics in those longitudinal studies is the not non-alcoholic family, and the, the only thing that's being transmitted is the capacity to tolerate more alcohol, system memory is being transmitted with DNA. DNA is not just physical hardware. Got it? System knowledge going back to the first bacteria. Everything in your genetic line. 
literally in the womb you actually recapitulate the entire genetic line you started out as two cells that became one multiple cells you had gills you were like an amphibian and then as soon as you hit air you were an air breather I mean, it is a fact. My, both my kids were, were water births. It's a fact that in the womb, the breathing reflex doesn't kick in. So if the kid is born underwater, they can swim around underwater connected to the placenta and not drown and still get O2. It's only once they hit air that the breathing reflex kicks in automatically. Okay, so we recapitulate the entire genetic line, every critter going back to the first bacteria in our DNA code. So understand, this is our 21st century quantum physics sense of DNA. We used to think that, oh, we're, we're machines. That's Cartesian. You're just a wind-up clock. Well, no. In quantum physics, oh, it's not just that it's a machine. It's a series of energy relationships. Okay? So in that sense, that software idea, and what's called, the field is called epigenetics itself. So most of the time, our culture doesn't teach you to be aware of the relationships between your physical body and the energies that animate or run through it, let alone your emotions or thoughts and how those affect your health, mental and physical, okay? But there are cultures that were based on that knowledge, particularly this Egyptian yoga and um, the martial arts systems that came out of that culture and the cultures that were around it, including the Chinese. So, most people think that they are their impulses, their emotions and drives and urges, that is their total identity, and not that they have emotions, impulses, and drives, and at a certain point, they can choose to control them if they have or are given the skill to do so. Control the breath is first baby step towards that skill set. So for example, if you're potty trained, you can hold it, unless there's some medical condition, right? We expect adults to be potty trained. Okay, but what about when you're bored, <coughs> hungry, horny, lonely, angry? Do you hold it then? Same thing, really. Okay, so you know how to hold the impulse and resolve it in another way than addictive behavior. So, you know, people actually, when I've asked them, well, what's why I'm taking this class? Okay, well, same therapy, it's education by a therapist. For free. For free, just, well, even when you're out of the class, it's free. So you recognize the DNA code. So about 10% of the DNA molecule concerns itself, as far as we can tell, with building proteins, physical structures. 90% is unknown, some say, the junk DNA. So for example, they can say there's an alcoholic gene, but they can't say which gene it is. And it's probably not a gene. Probably a complex of them turning on or off. Um, how many of you saw the movie Prometheus? Okay, so those what do they call them? Builders, engineers, whatever. Okay, so those are genetically identical to humans. Genetically identical, but they're bigger, stronger, etc. Same genome, different genes expressing. Okay, just like we are all the same critter. Different genes expressing. different genes expressing in different ways. So, part of what epigenetic concerns itself with is what turns on different genes and turns off different genes. 
Why do different people, for example, become addicted and other people in the same family do not? From a genetic point of view, it's a tricky question. Or we can just say, oh, some genes express and some don't. Individual variability. All right? So DNA is also coding non-physical information. So <laughs> from a certain point of view, the owner's manual, manual for the body is in the body. The instructions on how to live by those beings before you is uh, in within your genome. So not just humans, everything. So all DNA-based forms of life, from the smallest bacteria to vi or virus, algae, poppy, marijuana, Douglas fir to the largest whale, use chemicals to communicate between the cells. Okay? Plants, not being able to move, communicate and defend themselves using chemicals called allelochemicals. Take for example, um, how many of you like hot spicy things? Okay, so the plant can't run away, but the plant's strategy is to attract birds to eat the fruit to spread the seeds, because birds can spread the seeds farther than mammals can. All hot flavor, there's no flavor taste bud for hot. Okay, what hot food is, particularly capsaicin, peppers in particular, it's a chemical burn designed by the plant to drive away mammals. Serious, to drive away mammals. But we crazy clever monkeys, of course, breed hotter and hotter peppers. So, you know, my tolerance is for habanero, raw garlic cloves, right? And Tabasco to me is like, this is like vinegar with cayenne, please, weak, weak sauce. So the idea is this, it's a chemical burn. And what it does, and why we like it, is in response to pain, our body produces endorphins. So we get an endorphin rush. Pepper junkies. Okay? So that's one. So plants create chemicals to fight back against things in their environment. Right? So this is actually how we discovered, or actually rediscovered, penicillin. What a penicillin mold does is it infects bread, and then it creates a toxin around it to keep other molds from coming in. We synthesize that active ingredient to kill other bacteria, which then evolve around it. Same thing with like the HIV virus. It basically is designed to evolve around all the things that we throw at it. Okay? So animals know this and will eat certain plants, like us monkeys, with peppers. And so at best, this is good nutrition. At worst, it could become addiction because you're producing chemical change. Okay, so DNA is not just simply a set of energy relationships. It's not a physical molecule, but a set of energy relationships, as all quantum relationships are. The atoms don't actually touch each other. They are bonded energetically. The cell does not simply respond to physical and chemical signals, but also energy signals as well, some detectable with our current technology and some not. But literally, you know, we are in a microwave and electromagnetic flux here. Each of us who has a cell phone is basically hate to use this analogy, not entirely accurate, but it's a magnet for that. We're in a sea of those things. So, like life energy itself, we do not necessarily, we, we, uh, some are detectable, some are not. Like life is not detectable, but uh, you can modify it. Control the breath, you control the mind and the body and the emotions. Okay, some mind-body uh, disciplines teach you to do this This is your brain. So not just the old partnership commercial, but a couple of graphics. 
the organ made of 100 billion neurons, which respond to energetic, physical, and chemical signal. Doesn't care what. It's all signal. So, if you remember this from biology? Okay, here's how it works. You have a hundred billion of these in your brain. They don't touch, but they are surrounded by other cells called glial cells, which are like a smart glue to hold the mass together. And they transmit signal too. These are, this is simplified. So the soma is the body, which includes the nucleus. An axon is basically a tendril that comes close to another cell, but doesn't quite touch. And so axon starts from the body of this cell, goes to that cell, and a dendrite comes in from another cell into the body of that cell. There can be easily 200 of those for each cell to the surrounding cells. And they don't touch. And 100 billion, each with 200 connections. You do the math. That's a lot of message traffic. If they were all going at once. I mean, when I'm teaching meditation, all right? So try and get people to still their thoughts. I'm just saying, OK, physiologically, when you think about what is happening physically to your brain, in your brain, just by being awake, if you could reduce it to words, that's like 5,000 words a second. Just from being awake, hold standing up. You know, 200 some odd bones, hundreds of muscles, breathing, Eye, you know, the eye signal, visual signal, the air conditioning, the 60 second cycle hum on the lights, the television. Okay? A lot of message traffic. How do you make sense of it? Neurochemicals. Okay, so the original theory. Cells in your nervous system use neurotransmitters to communicate between themselves only, hence that word neurotransmitters, because we used to think that it was only between nerve cells. And then to communicate with the rest of the body, they use neurohormones. Okay, just like, you know, teenagers, raging hormones. Right? Under the influence of testosterone or whatever. Okay? The idea is those are also controlled by the nervous system. Okay? Neur neurohormones, while controlled by the nervous system, are also produced by other cells, ductless glands, white blood cells. So when we talk about there's a word called psychoneuroimmunology. If your mood is up, your immune system is strong. Your, immune is, your, your mood is depressed, you get sick. Sometimes certain drug states like marijuana, it's not just your brain getting stoned, your white blood cells are getting stoned too. And so some part of marijuana recovery is an immune system rebound where all of a sudden the white cells wake up and go, whoa, there's all these bacteria around there. Bummer, man. All right, so neurohormones, neurotransmitters, they're actually sometimes the same chemical. But this was the word to, make, to distinguish between these same chemicals being produced outside of the nervous system. Okay. So those cells can, can produce them independently. So for example, serotonin transmission. So there's like 85 plus neurochemicals that we've discovered, starting in 71. 85. 
And I'm only going to tell you about 10, which represent the major categories of drugs of abuse. There are probably more. Right? So if you think about neurochemicals that are the vocabularies of your cells, okay, each neurotransmitter is like a word. The same word can mean different things depending on where or how it's used. Some of them you do double duty. Like, what's up? Sup? Saponin? That was a... Michael Jackson was bad. Miles Davis is bad. Miley Cyrus is bad. <laughs> okay, same word. Different meanings. It was cool this morning. Miles Davis did birth of the cool. My ex did me cold. That was a cold jam. Cool jazz. Okay, same idea. Same word can mean different things depending on where and how it's used. Right? Okay, some neurotransmitters do double or even multiple duty depending on what the circumstances are and which cell is saying them to who. And what combinations? Okay, so after the word is given, one of two things happens. It's eaten by an enzyme or brought back into the cell in a process called reuptake. Now, if you remember that slide where I basically did the nicotine researchers, and they're using all these 13 cent words about acetylcholine esterase. So, acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. Right? So it's a choline, so it basically has to do with a nerve muscle interface. Right? So there's a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, which basically, when I clench my fist, acetylcholine is working. When I relax, acetylcholine is working. Two different sets of nerves doing the same thing using the same neurotransmitter. Raising my arm, lowering my arm, acetylcholine. Now, to turn off acetylcholine, you need acetylcholine esterase. Erase, but the ACE erase is the enzyme that turns it off. Kind of like, remember Pac-Man? Gobbles it up. So here's a axon terminal. Here's a dendrite for the other cell. Here is a neurotransmitter serotonin being released into the synapse. Cause this is between nerve cells. So remember, billions of nerve cells, they don't touch. There's a gap between them called the synapse into which this one is releasing serotonin, this one is responding to the serotonin signal, and in this case, so either Depending on the neurotransmitter, it's either turned off by an enzyme or it's taken up by another cell in a process called reuptake. Why this matters to you? If you're on like Paxil, Prozac, Cymbalta, Wellbutrin, SSRIs, Serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Okay, serum serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're drugs that affect serotonin levels. And the way they do it is by preventing the reuptake of serotonin. Therefore, there is more serotonin. Now, here's part of the challenge which I'll get to. There is no, when they talk about, when drug companies talk about you have low levels of this or that, no healthy level has ever been developed or discovered. So they are actually describing, oh, well, our theory with depression is, well, you have low levels of serotonin. Well, that actually may not be true but their drug is increasing the levels of serotonin. You seem to be depressed until you decide to kill yourself because, you know, Paxil has that side effect of 
causing suicide and well, that's a side effect, right? So serotonin regulates body temperature, sexual response, general arousal, and amount of sensory data. All right, so if you'll notice, you know, in those drug commercials where you know, it used to be, you know, in my youth, it was illegal for drug companies to advertise like that. You had to basically get it from a doctor, and a doctor basically prescribed the drugs that whoever was the most convincing drug detail person. And they come in with little pens and coffee cups and cute little gadgets and stuff like that, and sell the docs on that, and whoever is the best talker basically gets the business, and they, they actually used to take them on junkets and, you know, buy, buy them dinner. I mean, you know, my dad's a shrink, and, you know, I participated in some of those every Thursday where, you know, these drug detail, you know, in, in this particular case, this particular drug company used, you know, young women, right? You know, never <clears throat> cheated on my mom with them. But, I mean, it's like the implication is, okay, why are you whining and dining the shrink? For brand loyalty, you know, Eli Lilly or whoever, doesn't matter. A lot of them are doing it. The feds recently made it illegal in the last few years. <clears throat> okay, so... Serotonin regulates body temperature, sexual response, general arousal, and amount of sensory data. That's why in the drug ads, they talk about, you know, you might have experience changes in mood, suicidal afterthoughts, you might have sexual dysfunction, blah, 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 blah. Really fast in a low voice. But you're out of that hole that's following around, right? You're not in depression. For example, another neurotransmitter, dopamine and endorphin. Dopamine, so this uh, graphic uh, created by, with your tax dollars by the National Institute of Drug Abuse basically shows a, a, an uptake pump in the cell, basically bringing, you know, dopamine has been put into the synapse and is being brought back into the cell and uh, slotting into a receptor and then an opiate receptor and endorphin. Now, the way that we used to conceptualize this, the easy way for people to conceptualize this is basically thinking of the neuro, neurotransmitters as a lock, as a key, and the receptors as a lock. The actual relationship is more complex. It's more like a dance, because they don't actually touch. They just come in proximity to each other and cause basic changes inside the cell. But that's actually complicated <clears throat> to explain, so the lock and key thing is the popular way of conceive, conceiving, conceptualizing how this happens. All right, so the DNA code, which build bacteria and bacteria, viruses and venice, endorphins and Egypt, and supports an endogenous ligand system. So endo means within genus of the quality of genes beginning within genes so endogenous ligand ligand means chemicals which bind to receptors okay again referring back to that technical slide from last week this theory was basically discovered uh, in 71 so chemicals which your cells use to communicate with each other with each other are how you think and feel so if you start thinking about your emotions being as a result of these chemicals, and you can easily make the connection that certain drugs are feelings, too. Okay, so other living things use the same chemicals for different purposes. So for example, the poppy plant sap is not used by the poppy to make it feel better. Basically blood. The cannabis plant doesn't make THC to get you high. Sorry, humans, it's not about you. Okay, peppers don't make capsaicin to spice up your life. Bees don't make honey to give you a buzz. So anyway, neurochemicals, pep hormones, peptides, neurotransmitters, over 85, and I'm only gonna talk about 10. So these 10 neurochemical words. Serotonin, so what it does controls arousal, general arousal, 
data flow, body temp, and sleep. So as an example with the data flow, 100 billion neurons. Sometimes they're on, sometimes they're off, but the message traffic alone would be overwhelming. So one of the things that serotonin does is screen it out and enable you to screen now. So that's what its therapeutic use is. You want to increase serotonin levels with an SSRI. It allows you to screen stuff out. Those voices <coughs> or whatever. Body temperature and sleep. Dopamine, pleasure, memory, and brain reward. Brain reward is basically the mechanism which hardwires your brain to repeat behaviors that are survival oriented. You're thirsty, you drink, ah. You're hungry, you eat, ah. Sexual orgasm, ah. Cold, warm, ah. Repeat pleasurable behavior. Endorphins, emotional pain relief, orgasm. So you can see these actually have some interrelating, even though they're separate. Okay, so endorphin actually doesn't stop the pain. It just makes you feel better about the pain, psychologically. Norepinephrine, fight or flight response. I like to think of it as kind of, I'm a trekker, so Starship Enterprise. Shields up, phasers on lock, photon torpedoes. Acetylcholine, inhibitory and excitory. It either inhibits movement or it stimulates movement. Anandamide, the bliss molecule, that's what Ananda means, first discovered in uh, 1991 by Israeli neuro researchers. Basically, pain, coordination, memory, sensation. Phenylethylamine, so for example, it's a hormone you know, the butterflies in your stomach feeling when you're falling in love. Beta phenylethylamine. Testosterone, since we all make testosterone, male or female genomes. Secondary sex characteristics in both sexes, and then estrogen, same thing. So testosterone is an anabolic steroid used in uh, bodybuilding, etc. Estrogen replacement therapy for women who are in menopause, etc. Or also for people who are trans, changing, you know, going through surgery and hormone <clears throat> therapy. And GABA which is probably one of the most numerous neurotransmitters because it's f fairly simple and most of the receptor sites in the brain are for this particular one. Now, I've only done 10 out of 85. So we've never discovered what a balance for these are. We don't know what a healthy balance is, so actually the drug companies are kind of um, exaggerating when they say this drug re-stimulates a balance if they've never actually established what a balance is. If you basically test a normal person and a psychotic person neurotransmitter-wise, you can't tell the difference. So neurochemicals and drugs. So serotonin, LSD, mushrooms, SSRIs, Prozac, Paxil. 
So basically, the difference between LSD and Paxil is this. LSD competes with serotonin for receptor sites, therefore it blocks serotonin. Paxil, SSRIs, increase serotonin. Serotonin regulates data flow. More serotonin, more data is screened out. Less serotonin, more data floods in. Okay, so some of the things you see on LSD are not hallucinations, they are signal that is usually suppressed. So for example, if you are experienced, when you see trailers on acid, the way your brain processes this flow is at thousandth of a second, like a snapshot, but your brain edits it out. So you don't see the after image and thousand different trailers. You don't see the, you know, I recently had laser eye surgery and going out in the morning, you know, because there was like 1,200 hits on my retina with each laser. And so going out in the morning, the grass fluoresces between green and yellow, like, and then it fades. So is it there? So, I mean, yellow is a component of green. Is it actually there or what? It's a trip. Anyway, the idea is like, for example, don't think about pink elephants. Don't think about pink elephants. Stop. Okay, so the subject-object relationship. You see the pink elephants in your head. You don't see them in the room. That's a function of serotonin, so that you don't see your thoughts out in the room. But you can see your thoughts in your, as we say, mind's eye. LSD reminds, put, takes that out, so you see this hallucination, <clears throat> etc. Right? So, data flow. Some of the data is actually there. Some of it is not. Dopamine, cocaine. So since dopamine is involved with brain reward, what cocaine will do is that it will simulate that you're satisfied. So for example, a lot of things that we know with rats and rat in psychology, a lot of things that we know in psychology we know from rats and college sophomores. So the rats given the opportunity to self-administer cocaine, will do that until they die. And they'll, ignore, they'll cross electrified barriers, ignore fertile sex partners, etc., etc. There's also new data to suggest that if you actually supply them with alternative to cocaine, they will go to the alternative, not the cocaine. So, interesting. So anyway, dopamine is involved with brain reward. Cocaine basically basically exactly chemically duplicates the state that you are when you win something or achieve something artificially, which is why you see lots of athletes where it's about winning or other people who are highly successful, you know, replicating, attempting to replicate a certain feeling. And because it's, it's spendy, like Robin Williams said, cocaine is God's way of telling you you're making too much money. It has that uh, stigma attached to it. Endorphins. Opium, morphine, heroin, Demerol, fentanyl, Oxycontin, etc. Basically, working along that particular pathway. Doesn't stop pain, just makes you feel differently about it. Norepinephrine, methamphetamine, ecstasy, mescaline, Effexor, MDA, basically these are all along that particular pathway, the norepinephrine pathway. Acetylcholine, nicotine. So those of you who worship the tobacco god, basically say it relaxes you, but it doesn't put you to sleep. It's actually doing both because acetylcholine does both. All right, just like the illustration. 
you are being relaxed and you're being stimulated simultaneously. And it's a neurotoxin too, but hey. Anandamide. Marijuana and chocolate. That's why marijuana and chocolate work. To produce feelings of, you know, you feel better. Working along the anandamide pathway. Phenethylamine is also in chocolate. What do you mean by feeling butterflies in the stomach? Is that nervousness? Uh, it depends on how you interpret it. It could be new nervousness, it could be arousal, it could be pleasure, it could be anticipation of pleasure, it could be a lot of things. Because that's what anandamide works on. Sensory perception. Testosterone, steroids, estrogen, and then GABA is the basically the and uh, GHB and volatile inhalants basically work along the GABA pathway. So take for example anandamide and THC. <clears throat> so on the left is the brain's chemical, on the right is the drug, one of them. So cannabis doesn't make THC to get you stoned. It makes cannabinoids as a defense against fungus and mold in tropical areas. Particularly what it wants to protect is leaves, flowers, and seeds against mold. So, T, so what it does is basically send cannabinoids to those particular places and in tropical places, like for example, you've seen marijuana growing and you notice like the crystalline structure kind of reflects light that helps with, with not only with heat but also against mold and other things like that and it concentrates it. So back in the day before the domestic marijuana industry when uh, we basically look at I'm talking about we as a domestic consumer of drugs, America so would basically get Thai stick, you know, several different ki kinds of Mexican marijuana, Colombian marijuana, Jamaican, all tropical places which had high potency strains until we basically started cultivating them here and then you know, essentially simulating tropical conditions, heat lamps, et cetera, et cetera, controlling for mold, bugs, all that kind of stuff. Right, so THC, a section of the THC molecule resembles a neurotransmitter anandamide, just a section of it, but enough to basically stimulate those particular neurotransmitters. Right, so strictly speaking, there are no THC receptors, there are anandamide receptors. So for example, anandamide is involved with diverse brain areas, pain perception, balance, coordination, sensory input, movement, judgment, vision, so in certain high doses, it can be a hallucinogen. Uh, you could use it for pain. You could use it for nausea. You could use it for, you know, again, all the major pharmaceutical houses before 1938 had a medical marijuana preparation, usually an alcohol tincture, till they were made illegal. So looking at it in terms of, you know, not that I agree with this, but this is America, so money drives what policy is going to be. So if you were actually going to do medical marijuana, then you test it. For, I think the Colorado model is probably the best model I've seen in terms of from seed to harvest, the entire process is monitored by video as well as 
each strain tested for which constituents are in it so that you have a precise readout as to high THC or if you want a strain that doesn't get you stoned but does do pain control, high CBD, they have that all measured out rather than just smoke more butt. And then you can also, if it's really medical, then you have precise dosages for precise conditions rather than just smoke more butt like we have here, which is dumb. But, my opinion, anyway. Like opiates, while it doesn't stop pain, it enables you to deal with it emotionally. And naturally, since it produces pleasure, it's part of its effect, it's involved with brain reward, which automatically means that withdrawal is going to happen. And while it's not going to be always as dramatic as heroin withdrawal, um, there is a withdrawal syndrome. So a section of the THC molecule resembles anandamide. doesn't have to be an exact match. For example, endorphin means morphine within. So even though your body makes it, and not a plant opiate slot right into your endorphin receptors and probably uh, have some relationship uh, with anandamide being involved with pain as well. Different chemicals, same function, they probably affect each other. Okay, so when it is a problem. Okay, so if you have established a safe and effective dose for the drug, so if it's a pharmaceutical, it's a problem when you go beyond the safe and effective use for the drug. Dose for the drug. Two, thanks. Okay, it's a problem when you take a drug that wasn't prescribed for you. It's a problem when you take a substance not designed to be a drug. Paint, glue, glade. It's a problem when your use affects your body relationships, jobs, legal status then there's the whole tolerance and withdrawal piece. Okay? It's also a problem when you can't quit. It's a problem, like I said uh, the first week, if you feel you have to lie about it. So farming is an addictive behavior, taking prescription drugs that isn't yours, buying diverted pharmaceuticals, smoking or snorting pharmaceuticals, there's Jackie. There are all kinds of examples. So in terms of drugs or feelings, um, these are some of the feelings that people describe when they have or take certain substances. And we'll talk about this more. Hmm? All it says is nicotine. Like, you just feel nicotine. Well, yeah. <laughs> People say they, are, they take it to relax or, you know, for boredom, etc. The late Candace Pert basically discovered the neurotransmitter system uh, in 1971 and begins to ask questions like, which came first? Did the emotion trigger the release of the chemical or did the chemical cause the emotion? We'll take this up first time.